Good morning, everyone. We'll begin today's COVID-19 press briefing with Mayor John Cooper and Dr. Alex Jahangir, Chair of the Coronavirus Task Force and Chair of the Metropolitan Board of Health. We will also be joined today by Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College. We will also hear from Sandra Noble of Hip Hughes. We'll begin now with Mayor John Cooper. Good morning, Nashville. Good to see you this morning. The next weeks are critical in our fight against COVID-19. Our case counts are spiking and our hospitalization numbers are at a record high. But using our best tools, masks and social distancing have never been more important. Now, before diving into the numbers, I do want to mention Pfizer's positive vaccine announcement on Monday. Pfizer's preliminary results indicate that their vaccine appears to be working. And we are all hopeful that a vaccine will get us back to normal. And Nashvillians can be proud that our own public health department partnered with clinical research associates to test the Pfizer vaccine right here in Nashville. 315 Nashvillians have enrolled in the Pfizer trial since August the 21st. And Vanderbilt and Meharry are also taking part in clinical vaccine trials here in Nashville. The Pfizer announcement gives a timetable for the beginning of the end of the pandemic. But as we wait for a COVID vaccine, please take a few minutes to go get a vaccine we can get right now, and that is the flu shot. The nationwide surge in COVID-19 cases that began in October is continuing, and Nashville is no exception. The United States just saw a record number of cases yesterday and is averaging over 100,000 cases per day. Here in Nashville, the 14-day average case count is now 324. Our rolling seven-day average of new cases per 100,000 residents is now 50. Numbers have been dramatically rising across Tennessee. But this metric shows that Tennessee is just the 21st state in the country, highlighting the truly national nature of this emergency. And even with our spiking case counts, Nashville is the 41st highest county in the 21st highest state. The highest counties in Tennessee have rates more than double ours. Now, there have never been more COVID patients, 292 currently in Davidson County than there are right now. About 30% of those patients are from outside Davidson County, and we must focus on masks and social distancing to preserve our hospital capacity. The virus is everywhere, and that understanding has to shape our behavior. This challenge requires we take personal responsibility to wear a mask, socially distance, and limit your contacts outside of your household. Remaining vigilant is more important than ever as temperatures drop, flu season hits, and we prepare for the holidays. Now, there are 4,600 COVID-19 tests conducted in Nashville every day. Please go get tested if you've been exposed or have symptoms. Wait times are short at Metro's assessment sites, and tests results reliably come back within two days. Testing and isolating works. Masks work. Social distancing works. And based on where the health department continues to see most cases coming from, things like backyard gatherings, family get-togethers, celebrations, and trips, I again urge Nashvillians to exercise caution when you're around people outside of your household. Now, the Metro Public Health Department now urges Nashvillians not to gather with friends and family outside of your household. If you must, please limit gatherings to 10 or fewer people. And with 30% of cases reporting possible exposures in the workplace, the health department is also encouraging working remotely when possible. Now, if you're feeling sick, please stay home. And if you get a call or text from the health department, please cooperate and answer questions so they can effectively trace cases and stop the spread. We need your help in getting the word out. We have health orders in place to help regulate the safety of our public spaces. But we need each of us to take responsibility for the private space. Don't drop your guard just because you are around people you know. Now, the risk of letting down your guard was mentioned in this week's report from Vanderbilt Health Policy. The report stated that people 
may not understand the risk as contact tracing. The Vanderbilt researchers looked at mask mandates in Tennessee counties and concluded that COVID-19 death rates are higher in counties without a mask mandate. The death rates in counties without a mask mandate are twice as high as counties that were late in adopting a mask mandate and nearly four times higher than in early mask counties like Davidson. Masks are critical, and as much as we all want to get back to normal, that doesn't mean we can pretend things are normal. Don't share your air with other people. Mask up and stay at least six feet apart. Consistent with advice from the White House Task Force, always wear a mask in public and when you're with anyone outside your household. The White House Task Force advises that Tennesseans should not hold gatherings beyond our immediate household until cases and test positivity decrease significantly. Now, even with the vaccine news this week, we're going to be at, at this for at least several more months, and we can't give in to virus fatigue. We will get through this together. Now, I spoke last week about Thanksgiving, which is now two weeks away. Thanksgiving can be a super spreading event unless we're very careful. While the safest holiday is a virtual holiday, we know many people are planning Thanksgiving gatherings. Please limit your Thanksgiving gathering to 10 people and consider getting tested within the week before you visit a high-risk relative. Now, especially if you plan to visit older, older relatives for Thanksgiving, you have a personal responsibility to keep them safe. By limiting your social contacts and your own potential exposure for the next two weeks, starting today. Now, I'm also pleased to welcome Sandra Noble, co-owner of Hip Hughes and a recipient of CARES Act grant funding via Pathway Lending. Hip Hughes is a local screen printing business that provides mobile and live production. Now, Pathways has allocated $2 million of CARES Act funding through over 300 grants to small businesses in Nashville. Overall, Metro awarded $5.5 million from CARES Act funding to support small businesses and music venues with technical assistance and grants. And to date, 768 businesses have received assistance. This funding led to forming of Renew Nashville. And that's a collaboration between five nonprofits, Conexion Americas, Nashville Entrepreneur Center, Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce, Nashville Business Incubation Center, and Pathway Lending. Renew Nashville is a citywide initiative designed to provide resources and technical assistance to help small business survive the pandemic. Now, small business owners can access weekly free office hours with attorneys, accountants, bankers, marketing experts, and others. And business owners can sign up today at renewnashville.co. That's renewnashville.co, not .com. Now, I'm hopeful that newly elected Congress can come together to pass our Save Our Stages Act and another round of federal support for businesses affected hugely by the pandemic. And finally, let's move on to the best part of the press conference. That's Nashville's Community Hero of the Week. This week's hero is none other than the two-time World Series champion and 2018 MLB MVP, Overton High School's own Marcus Mookie Betts. In addition to being a leader on the field, Mookie is the co-founder and president of Acts Inspired by Mookie Foundation, through which he donated PPE and food boxes to Nashville and Compton during the pandemic. Mookie surprised Bordeaux residents with free groceries and sent lunch to frontline workers at TriStar Centennial Hospital. Mookie, all of us in Nashville are proud of your accomplishments and thankful for your leadership. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Alex Shahanger, Chair of the Metro Nashville Coronavirus Task Force. Alex. Thank you, Mayor Cooper, and good morning, Nashville. Here's the latest on coronavirus in Davidson County. We now have 38,802 cases. New cases since yesterday is 540. That now leads to an active case count of 3,139. Last week at this point, we were at 2,435. 
Our rolling 14-day average of new cases is 324, again, up from 266 just this time last week. And a seven-day average of new cases per 100,000 is at 50, up from 42 last week. Our seven-day test positivity rate is also increasing, up to 8.7%. And now in Nashville, over 570,000 tests have been conducted in Davidson County residents. There have been 332 Nashvillians who have died from COVID-19, 16 just in the last week. The transmission rate in Nashville is 1.15, which is up from where it was last week at 1.05. Even with all these numbers, Davidson County is still the 41st out of 95 counties in disease activity in our state. That means 40 state or 40 counties are doing worse per capita than we are. Now, hospital bed capacity has been a, a, a interest of a lot of people lately, and, and it should be. Hospital capacity in Middle Tennessee is currently 11%, and Davidson County is 4%. And ICU capacity is 6%, both in our county and in our Middle Tennessee region. Now, we continue to see hospitalizations continue to go up. In fact, today, there are 292 individuals in national area hospitals with COVID-19. 107 of those people are in the ICU. And one out of three, if not more, are from outside of our county. Nashville's healthcare systems are really important and they take care of our entire region. And I've been speaking to our healthcare um, systems and their leaders almost daily over the past week, and they continue to report that they are keeping up with the volumes, but it is tight. Now, I know that our hospitals, along with me um, and the mayor and others are increased with these new cases. And so we must act and act now to flatten the curve. Now, I've heard and seen some of the comments lately about the vaccines and how this will now end the spread. Well, it is true eventually, but not now. We need to still act as if um, this is critical now because it is critical now. And, and it is very encouraging to hear all the news around vaccines or the newly um, approved antibodies that can, you can get for people who've recently got infected. But we are still months away from these being widely available. We cannot put our hopes in a vaccine that is many months away to stop the spread of the virus today. Now, I really don't know how many more people need to get really sick or how many more people need to die, but this is the reality of what's happening up now. And so please do what you need to do to keep the spread down. I've also heard people say COVID-19 is not as bad as the flu. So we shouldn't really make a big deal about it. Well, that, that's also not true. In fact, just a, a week ago, Vanderbilt did another study in which they showed that the amount of hospitalizations and deaths in the state so far from COVID-19 are greater than the past two years of the flu. COVID is worse than the flu. And if you've talked to anyone that has experienced it, or as I did yesterday, I spoke with the wife of a person who died from it, it's a really tough disease, much worse than what you hear about from the flu. So remember this as you start moving forward. Now I'm gonna be as direct as I can be. If you wanna keep your schools open, if you wanna keep your economy open, if you wanna go back to some normal sense of, of life, it's very easy what we can do right now wear a mask. Studies have shown it. You've all heard the experts talk about it. Honestly, the time for debate's over. Wear a mask to stop the spread of the vaccine. There's, that's really the only thing you can do at this point. So this is my, my plea to you all. Please do it. And on that, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Hildreth. Good morning, Nashville. On the afternoon of May the 16th in 1997, a very special event happened at the White House, hosted by the president. It was a gathering of five elderly black men, ranging in age from 95 to 110 years old. Their families and the families of three other men who could not be there were also in attendance. The sitting president at the time, William Jefferson Clinton, addressed these men as their host. Among the things he said to them was the following, and I quote, the eight men are a living link to a time not so long ago that many Americans would prefer not to remember, but we dare not forget. The United States government did something that was wrong, deeply, profoundly, 
morally wrong. It was an outrage to our commitment to integrity and equality for all of our citizens, unquote. These men were survivors of the Tuskegee experiment, an experiment so egregious and ethically out of bounds that the President of the United States felt compelled to apologize to them and to their families. In 1932, physicians from the United States Public Health Service enrolled 600 mostly poor, mostly uneducated black men in a study, natural study, natural history study of syphilis. The men were told they were being treated for bad blood, but in fact, they weren't being treated for anything at all. And even in 1945, when penic penicillin was available and accepted as a great treatment for syphilis, these men were not informed that there was a treatment and they were not treated for their, their disease. This experiment that was originally planned for six months lasted 40 years and may have lasted longer than that were it not for reporters who raised questions about the ethics of this experiment. The Tuskegee experiment in which African Americans were subject to such egregious lapses in ethics at the hands of government physicians figures prominently in why so many of us are apprehensive about and mistrustful of medical research, especially in minority communities. However, you should know that as out of bounds as the Tuskegee experiment was, as a result of that experiment, human subject research was changed forever in very positive ways. In 1974, two years after the experiment was ended, a national commission was established to develop strict guidelines and regulations were put in place to protect the welfare and health of human subjects that participate in research. Some notable components of this that I need you to know about include the following, informed consent, inst institutional review boards, and data safety monitoring boards. Anyone who decides to participate in a clinical trial are gonna get lots of information about the nature of the trial itself, the drug that's being tested, why it's being tested, possible side effects, and lots of other information that's available to the participants. And only after you have heard all of that, you must give your explicit consent to participate. Institutional review boards are panels of experts and laypersons who must review the protocols of clinical trials and decide that they are ethical and protect the welfare and safety of participants. Data safety monitoring boards consist of experts and patient advocates who periodically review the data and make sure that people are safe and that the study is progressing as planned. And you also need to know that before you participate in a clinical trial, your health will be assessed and if the physician who is enrolling people in the study feel that for any reason you'll put yourself in harm's way by participating, you will not be allowed to participate. The bottom line is this. It's understandable why some individuals might have concerns about being treated as guinea pigs, as the men were in the Tuskegee experiment, but as a consequence of the Tuskegee experiment, human subject research is now very different than it was before, and the safety of participants is one of the highest priorities. As the mayor said, the recent news about the Pfizer vaccine is very encouraging. More than 40,000 people participated, and the data review committee concluded that the vaccine was 90% effective, much better than we had hoped for. There are five other vaccines making their way through the late stages of testing, so there's still a need to enroll participants in those studies. I would like to encourage as many Nashvilleians as possible, especially African Americans and Latinx community individuals, to participate in the trials. Because, as we all know, these individuals are much more likely to get infected, to get severe disease, and to die. So it's very important that we know that vaccines work in those populations. So please consider participating in vaccine trials that are now underway at Meharry Vanderbilt and Clinical Research Associates. So Nashville, it's pretty obvious that the country is on the precipice of a logarithmic expansion of COVID-19. What that means is record number of cases means record numbers of hospitalizations, which means record numbers of people dying. We cannot force leaders to do the right thing, but we can take our own responsibility to protect ourselves. Please keep in mind that masks work in both directions. 
they prevent you from giving the virus to someone else, but they also prevent someone else from giving you the virus. So please protect yourselves and your families by wearing a mask. And I know it's going to be very tempting to get together on Thanksgiving. It's one of my favorite times of the year. But I also am intent on keeping people safe from harm. So limit your gathering sizes to just a few people that you know have been in your bubble. And as the mayor and Dr. Jehanger said, it's really imperative that if you're gathering with people you don't know who have not been in your bubble, you need to wear a mask. And you need to ask them to do the same. You're, it's the right thing to do. We can take control of this ourselves and protect ourselves. And again, I'm hopeful that the new administration will do the right thing and put together a nationally coordinated strategy. But until such time as that happens, let us take the responsibility to protect ourselves. And by doing that, we protect our communities. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Sandra Noble from Hip Hughes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Um, thank you, Mayor and Metro COVID, uh, Metro's COVID-19 Task Force for inviting me to speak and for navigating and leading Nashville through this pandemic. As, um, as, as we said, I'm Sandra Noble, co-founder of Hip Hughes with Tracy Dunn. We are a mobile swag bar company setting up an interactive gift stations at events where guests get to customize and print their own gift on site in just a couple of minutes at events. So as we all know, this pandemic has affected businesses in various ways. And for us in the events and tourism industry, it's been quite catastrophic. Through the Metro COVID-19 relief assistance, we applied for and received a small business grant through Pathway Lending, and it's helped us to keep our employees on payroll, pay rent, and quite frankly, um, keep innovating so that we can create new and awesome things for virtual events and just get creative until live events actually come back in any large or true capacity to Nashville. We all miss them. <laughs> so um, Nashville, our small businesses are the very soul of our community. Please continue to support us. Please wear your masks, please social distance, and let's get through this together. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, before we start, I would like to also let you know that in addition to today's speakers, we have Director Chief William Swan of the Office of Emergency Management and Nashville Fire Department, and Dr. Michael Caldwell, Director of Health of the Metro Public Health Department, are here to also answer your questions. And with that, we'll start our questions first with Nancy Amons. Go ahead, Nancy. Good morning, thank you. I have a series of questions. Um, with the numbers as bad as they are, are we going to consider going back um, to an earlier phase, closing down much like New York City and some of Europe is doing? Um, also, I have a question about the um, instant tests that are done out of county on Davidson County residents. How are those reported to your numbers? Um, and the final question is for Dr. Hildreth. Has he been contacted by anyone in Washington? And does he have, is he expecting to have any role in the uh, new administration? Thank you. So the first question is, are you considering going back to a different phase? Well, thank you, Nancy, for that question. Um, the answer right now is no. Um, we, we are regulating the public space. Um, there are enforcement actions and there are restrictions. Many of the restrictions have stayed in place that other places are um, thinking about readopting. So we are um, also subject to what goes on in our state and we can't keep just our county safe. We have to recognize that we need a broader response to be more effective in this. So what we need to say is wear masks socially distance, take personal responsibility, get through Thanksgiving without it being a super spreading event. Um, but right now, that's our message today. I think myself and Alex and, and Dr. Hildreth, um, that it's, it's within each of our powers to limit the spread. And then that's what we're encouraging everybody to do. Thank you. Good morning, Nancy. Uh, we are working very proactively with all uh, new tests that might be done uh, either in the county or out, out of county. 
so all tests, any positive results, must be reported uh, to the State Department of Health. Once it gets to that system, uh, if there's a Nashville-Davidson County resident, uh, we get informed about that. But we don't stop there. Uh, we know that there are a lot of these testing companies that are testing uh, events or people in the community, and we are uh, assessing each one of those. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, there was a rapid testing done uh, at the JW Marriott for the Republican uh, National uh, Committee uh, event. Uh, we assured that those tests, if they were positive, even if they were not Davidson County residents, that we were immediately alerted to any positive tests so that we could provide guidance and uh, assist uh, with those test results. Uh, for uh, the CMA awards, for example, everyone had to be tested on site. That was a, a special testing center. We were informed daily of any positive tests. So we're working uh, very proactively to assure that any tests that are done uh, in Davidson County, that we learn about those results right away. Thank you. Uh, with respect to me being asked to uh, assist with the transition, I've been asked to submit my CV, uh, but I have no idea as to what that really means. But of course, if I'm asked to assist in any way to get us through this crisis we're in, of course I'm going to do just that. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tosin Fakili from Channel 4. Go ahead, Tosin. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. I have three questions. The first is, does the mayor feel like the city's contact tracing efforts are effective right now with so many cases, so many new cases each day? Um, my second question is, we've heard stories from recent COVID positive people saying um, they've either not been called or asked about their travels and places they visited two weeks prior to their positive diagnosis. So I'm just wondering, how can we trust the cluster reports being released if it seems like there could be holes in contact tracing? And my final question is, um, we've seen people overcrowded in lines trying to get into the Birch Building and I've personally seen elevators that have been packed. So is it safe for people to go through security and to wait in line for a public building in those kind of crowded scenarios? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tozan. I'll go first and ask Alex to, um, and Dr. Caldwell to talk about contact tracing. Contact tracing is very hard. I think this city and all other places that are doing it find it hard. You do wonder if kind of a national platform for do that might make it considerably easier because people are moving across county lines and state lines. Um, and we I hope in the future that we do that. And then let me say I'm super grateful for you identifying a potential problem at the Birch building so that we can be focused on uh, anti-clustering. Um, and again, I'm grateful to you and also citizens go to Hub Nashville and express a concern so that public health can, can get on it and make sure that we're as safe as we possibly can be. We're in a community spread condition and that means it's, it's everywhere. One change isn't going to be able to limit the growth or the spread of the disease as much as it used to, as much as it used to in a com community spread environment but all safety precautions matter. And again, thank you um, for alerting us to a potential problem at the Birch Building. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. And Tosin, thank you for that question. Um, in regards to contact tracing, I'll tell you about Nashville. The moment we as, um, receive um, a positive case from the NDS state system, 89% of people have their contact tracing interview conducted within 24 hours. 97% of people have their contact tracing interview conducted in 48 hours. Um, that's how we're able to tell you that 35% of these clusters are um, from, from um, households, up from 25% last week. 28% are from work, down from 34% the week before. Um, what is critical in addition to that is that people need to um, respond when we call. 
We now have implemented texting. We now um, have outsourced some of the, some of the, to get additional support through the same um, organization the state uses. So, um, I think we are we are doing a, a reasonable job as as a city. Now, again, the clock starts for the city the moment we get our data from the state, um, and so. Yeah, I mean, I think 97% in 24 hours is, or 48 hours is a, is a reasonable number. Thank you. And Dr. Caldwell. Has. Thank you. Yeah, we uh, have 125 contact tracers with multiple language skills, uh, and we are asking as many questions as uh, we can ascertain where people may have been exposed. And what we're finding is that people have been moving about uh, a lot. So it's hard to always ascertain where they may have uh, gotten uh, COVID. So we want to emphasize again for people to do their best to limit uh, where they go so that if they are positive, we can better understand uh, who they might have gotten it from and who they may have uh, exposed. Uh, I feel confident that we have prepared uh, for this surge uh, with contact tracing capabilities, and we are responding. And as Dr. Jahangir uh, just uh, noted, we have new technology through the teletask system where we now have uh, sent and continue to send uh, these uh, text messages to people to alert them and to help us with our contact tracing uh, immediately. In addition, if our contact tracers uh, don't have enough capacity, we have an added layer of protection with an organization called Extend, and that's in a partnership with the Tennessee Department of Health, which we can offload some uh, extra cases uh, if needed. But right now, uh, our staff uh, are able to uh, work with most of the cases right now that are coming in, but we do have these added layers of protection. Thank you. Our next question is from Julia Palazzo. Julia. Hi, good morning. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, in regards to the school board meeting earlier this week, we heard some pretty emotional statements from teachers. A lot of them saying that they felt abandoned and betrayed, that sick kids are still coming into schools. If uh, the mayor, Dr. Jahangir, could give a response to them of their concerns uh, right now during this time. And Dr. Jahangir, another question for you as well. Um, Brown University put out some research about states changing their testing strategies. Um, can you speak about just the current testing strategy in Nashville and possibly the state and if there is a need to ramp up testing um, with the cases going up? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, Julia, I'll go first and then let me turn it over to Dr. Alex. Um, the last I was informed by our public health department, there's been no in-school transmission. I think that's just an important statement for people to understand. There is a lot of transmission going on in the community and after hours, but uh, I think uh, we share the teachers and parents deep concern about the safety of children at school, but right now we've not detected schools themselves as being the source of that concern. I think it's something for the school board to, to be on top of and in the closest possible contact with public health and contact tracing, going to the earlier question. It's one of the reasons it's so important that we learn as much as we can about safe and unsafe practices and conditions going on in the county. But right now there's not been in school transmission. Um, now, that being said, there is going to be outbreaks of this quarantining and concerns. And again, I know the school board is working hard every day to try to get, get that right. Thank you, Dr. Alex. Thank you. Um, Julie, thank you. Um, regarding the testing strategy, you know, I'm, I'm really proud actually of the testing strategy Nashville had implemented from the beginning. Our, our, the city as a whole, as thus far as I mentioned, has tested about 570,000 individuals. Our assessment sites have tested nearly 250,000, 250,000 tests for free to Nashvilleians, thanks to our partnerships with our health systems and, and Meharry Medical College specifically. In addition to that, Meharry uh, Medical College um, does um, mobile testing on the weekends. Um, we, our health department does, um, has three days a week in which we do extended hours 
for um, geared for anyone, but really focused at, at public school um, community. Um, we are increasing our hours during the um, Thanksgiving holiday, I believe next next week or week after. We'll make sure you have that information. And within the city, um, in addition to what we just talked about publicly, um, I know colleges such as Vanderbilt test their um, students. Certain private schools are starting to test their students um, regularly. Um, industries, hospitality, obviously the music industry is, is increasing testings. So as a city, actually, I think our testing strategy is pretty, pretty good. With that said, our positivity rate is still 8.7% you want to get that number below 5%. So, so expanding testing may help that, um, but it shows how broad this, this, test, this um, disease pre prevalence is currently. Um, what the state is doing from what I've seen, they're increasing um, further um, mobile testing um, with the National Guard, which I think is, is good. But as, as one of the lines that Dr. Hildreth of all people said early on in this pandemic that stuck with me is the only way to fight an invisible um, uh, invisible enemy is to make that um, enemy visible. And the way you get make it visible is by testing. As a city, I think we have probably one of the best testing um, anywhere in the country. And I, I would welcome that challenge to, 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 to anyone to look at that. Um, but we want that positive rate to be lower and um, maybe testing more at some point would find thing. but we're doing a pretty reasonable job. So thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Brett Kelman with the Tennessean. Good morning, Brett. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this question is primarily for the mayor, but I would welcome responses from anyone who wants to provide one. Uh, mayor Cooper, for months you have called for a more cohesive strategy on the state and federal level, specifically in references to masks. Um, at this point, if Governor Lee or President Trump or President-elect Joe Biden were to initiate a mask mandate, what gives you any confidence it would make a difference? It, it, you, you've experienced firsthand this year how politically divided this nation is. How, why would, why would that change anything? What, what makes you think people would listen? Um, well, thank you, Brett. I, I do think that there's a moment with a fresh federal response um, that will demonstrate that leadership matters. Um, and also, data matters. And the data you see from the Vanderbilt study just issued this past week and all over the country shows that masks do work. The trick is to have a high compliance rate. If it's only 50%, that's working at a relatively poor level. If it's 80 or 90%, that works extremely effectively. And that's why having a national response to masks so that everybody routinely understands them to be your duty to your neighbor, to your family, and to yourself has to help. A mixed message on this subject leads to poorer compliance, and you're in an environment where every percentage point of compliance is very important. The difference between 50% and 80% is going to be very important. Now, um, that's a important step going forward is a unified national response on something that we just know is true and statistically is true. We also need a federal response to a second CARES Act, which has been promised all year. And here we are in November and it has never happened. And we have a lot of businesses and schools that are going to be dependent on that getting done by our federal partners. But leadership does matter. And I do feel that um, the burden of proof needs to shift over to people of why in the world are you not wearing a mask? Let's do right by each other. I'm not being a good neighbor when I don't do something that we know is so powerfully true, proven once again by all the statistics gathered during the course of this pandemic and right here in Tennessee. Thank you. Our next question is from Kathleen Siri at Channel 17. Go ahead, Kathleen. To, if you want to email me a question, you're welcome to do that. Our last question is from Kara Hartnett. Go ahead, Kara. Hi, thank you. Um, Mayor Cooper, you said that you don't want to revert to earlier phases of reopening uh, just yet, relying on 
on what's already in place and personal responsibility. But is there a point in this surge that Metro will have to intervene if the traje if the trajectory doesn't change? And and if so, what will what will happen and what will that what will that look like? Well, uh, Kara, I mean, as we've said back to March, um, hospital capacity is going to be the most important single metric. If our hospital partners were to feel that they could not manage the surge, we would need to respond to that. But in the meantime, I think it's important for people to understand, um, again, I'd love Dr. Alex's or Dr. Hildreth's view on this, we're in a community spread condition. Early on, it was not everywhere in the community and you could target certain areas with rules governing the public space that you would feel would be especially effective. Right now with community spread, it is everywhere and it requires the private space not being as much of a, as a, much of a concern. So we have to dig deep and double down and get right with what we know already works as being our most effective response. And we need to get mass compliance up over 80%, not only here in Davidson County, but everywhere, frankly, if we're gonna push back on a disease that's now reached the community spread. Once upon a time, regulating public spaces was very important because you were trying to keep it from getting out of the hay barn, but now it's spread out into the field. And that's gonna require every one of us being a, a firefighter themselves in order to push that back. And so uh, I wish it was so easy that a single government -y type response was gonna fix this problem, but it's not that easy. It's gonna require all 700,000 of us in Davidson County being on it all the time to get us through this next phase. But I have faith in us and I have faith in Davidson County and in the state that we will have each other's backs and be good neighbors and use the tool that works. And that tool, rather than a extra regulation on the public space is frankly what's gonna have to be required in this era of community spread. Thank you. Actually, we're gonna try Kathleen Siri again. It appears she's still on. Kathleen, are you there? Yes, I am. Good morning. Can you hear me? All right. My question isn't directly about the coronavirus. It's more related to the Church Street Park Improvements Master Plan. We're seeing reports that it won't be complete until March, even though the end date was initially planned for August or October. Several council members are also saying this process hasn't been public or transparent. Um, can Mayor Cooper address these concerns and answer why this project has been on hold for so long, since we know it's in a very public area of downtown that a lot of people walk through? Also, how are these improvements going to help this area? Thank you. Um, Kathleen, I couldn't hear everything in the last bit of your question. Uh, take it the you're expressing appropriate frustrations with Church Street Park being completed, uh, which again, it's being completed with uh, private donations um, put in by neighbors uh, on an exciting plan created by a nationally leading landscape architect. Um, well, heck yeah, we're all frustrated and doing public engagement in the time of COVID is something that we have to work out. So things are gonna go slower and feel like less public engagement than we had hoped. The, they, there have been innumerable public meetings uh, on this and outreach, I, I am told, and that come to my office and briefed me on the exciting plans going forward. But as in Nashville, all capital spending matters have had an unfortunate kind of delay pushed by COVID and for various other reasons. And we look forward to that being dislodged and moving forward. And again, it is exciting that the neighborhood is making the investment in this space and it's being done uh, through the auspices of a very nationally recognized figure in public open area spaces. And so I hope that the product on the other end is something that the community is super proud of. We were not able to get it done by August for the celebration of the 
the amendments passage, which had been the initial goal. And however, hopefully we'll not, it'll not pass much longer than a delay of a few quarters. Thank you. Those are all the questions we have today. Uh, I'd like to thank Sandra Noble for joining us this morning. Um, of course, we're grateful to Tim Heaslip and our partners at Bridges for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing for providing the ASL translation at these press briefings. The next COVID-19 press briefing will air on Thursday, November 19th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you for joining us, and that concludes today's briefing. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.